As kids, we worship the heroes. As adults, we understand the villains. Random Twitter quote. The Star Wars prequels, as much as I intellectually appreciated their pacing as a series, etc., did ruin childhood for millions of fans. Even though it was George Lucas, the franchise's own father, it was still rewriting history to the majority of fans. What it accomplished by bringing Star Wars to a new generation, it did so only to the same extent it alienated its original base. This is why when Charlie Rose interviewed George Lucas and Lucas described the Disney sequels as like selling his kids to white slavers, it is more than a little hypocritical to many of those most loyal to his work. What the prequels taught me about George Lucas as an individual, as opposed to the average Star Wars fan, was that Lucas, unlike his fans, loves backstory. Comedian Patton Oswalt put it best when he parodied Lucas by saying, You get to see him as a little kid, about every one of the original trilogy's most fearsome villains. To put it in a way Lucas' generation can imagine it, this was defanging the werewolf from the point of view of Oswald's generation. In keeping with this trend, though, let's defang another werewolf, the presently popular comic book adaptation film, Joker, which spotlights a comic strip villain so acutely as to bring him into better focus than even Lucas's prequels could the character of Darth Vader. The character, Joker, was the premier issue counterpoint to the debut of the hero, Batman, in the first issue of his own comic book series, published by DC Comics on April 25, 1940. The Joker character was introduced as being pre-established in an ongoing storyline that was never fully explained in the comic book series, and thus was left largely up to later creators to imagine. Artist Bob Kane was, ostensibly, the legal claimant to the character's creation, as Kane is unquestionably credited with co-creating the character Batman with author Bill Finger, as he first appeared in DC's Detective Comics, issue 27, May 1939. Kane and his disputed co-creators cited the influence on the Joker character of the April 1869 novel by Victor Hugo and 1928 silent film by Paul Lenny, the man who laughs about a dispossessed royal heir disfigured by a Chelsea grin, sometimes called a Glasgow smile, where both cheeks are sliced to extend the mouth past the lips with a blind lover. Although the facially scarred version of the Joker character appeared in the 2008 Christopher Nolan film, The Dark Knight. His backstory was not fully explained even then, and it was left until now, 2019, for the character to be given his own solo film and for his originating backstory to finally be told. Todd Phillips, tasked with this, produced what many critics call an artistic masterpiece and what many others call socially irresponsible. Long before Joker's release, Clerks director Kevin Smith's Fat Man Beyond podcast co-host Mark Bernardin mused it might be the right movie at the wrong time. 
Shortly later, the Pentagon agreed, and in many theaters, the film opened with armed police stationed in the crowd to quell any mass uprising, seeing the movie might stir up in the audiences. His portrayal of Joker in Nolan's Dark Knight by thespian Heath Ledger was so immersive that, some claim, it drove him insane and led to his not long subsequent drug-related death or possible suicide. There are other suggestions about this event made by conspiracy theorists that Ledger was being initiated into the Hollywood Illuminati elites at the time and had, perhaps, threatened to refuse them and go public. These rumors are, of course, unsubstantiated by any legitimate reporting. Nevertheless, they add to the mystique surrounding the character's portrayal in films, such as in the Everyone Who Wears the Cape Ends Up Dead rumor about actors portraying DC's Superman, which, of course, is absurd, since everyone, caped or not, eventually dies anyway. In the 2019 origin story film, Joker, is played by renowned character actor Joaquin Phoenix, the younger brother of deceased child star from the 1980s, River Phoenix. Bringing to the table his own cleft lip and dislocated shoulder, Phoenix adds to the performance a unique physique, complemented further by his own dedication to the craft, inspiring him to lose 52 pounds to play the role. The resultant, skeletal-looking bodily portrayal was used on-screen often to demonstrate how uncomfortable the character was in general, which was juxtaposed by his occasional dance sequences when Joker figuratively lets his hair down. Aside from the acting, everything else about the film is exceptional as well. The costuming, makeup and hair, lighting, camera work, etc. is all above par for the modern Hollywood movie, and the writing, pacing, and plot of the story also convey the sort of art house influence in forming the movie as an exile from the trite West Coast norm. The director is known for making comedies, but has been quoted saying he made Joker as an expression of his no longer feeling safe to make comedies. The film, as social commentary, explains his point of view overtly, succinctly. The plot of Joker is simple. He is an unhappy, borderline mentally disturbed, party clown, an aspiring stand-up comedian whom, when illegally armed by a friend after taking a beating from random kids, takes his life into his own hands by killing some abusive stockbrokers on a subway train one night, leading ultimately to a complete collapse of his sanity and descent into a riot-inducing crime spree. According to the plot, he suffers from a physical and mental condition that causes him to suffer from uncontrollable fits of laughter whenever he experiences too much emotional stress. As the plot progresses, we learn this may have been induced in him due to severe beatings, malnourishment, dehydration, and deprivation he experienced as a young child. This is where the premise becomes particularly interesting for me, being a conspiracy theorist hound hot on the trail of a realistic villain's backstory. The plot reveals that Joker, named in this portrayal Arthur Fleck, was actually conceived as a bastard son by millionaire magnate and Batman's father also, Thomas Wayne. When Arthur confronts Thomas about this, 
Wayne denies Fleck and proclaims Arthur's mother insane and a liar. Thus, Joker, the clown prince of crime, is, supposedly, some twenty years his senior, an illegitimate half-brother of Bruce Wayne, who becomes, some twenty years after the events in the movie, the Dark Knight, Batman himself. So, at age ten, Bruce's parents are shot in a dark alleyway, leading to the series of events wherein he devotes his life to fighting crime, dressed as a menacing vampiric symbol of shadows, darkness, and terror. This would make the Joker, by the time of the first appearance in Gotham of Batman, when Bruce Wayne would have been around 25, around the age of 50 himself, being that Arthur Fleck is around 25 years Bruce Wayne's elder in this setting. This would, of course, contradict some of the tellings of the tale, but then DC Comics has never cared much about continuity. What interests me about this particular plot twist is imagining how it would have related to the characters had the same story been told and set at the time when the comic book was first released. If the Batman was around 25 in 1940, and by this storyline's description, then Joker would have been around 50 in 1940, then the origin story of the Joker, told in this movie, would have taken place around the year 1915. I think this is interesting because it seems to fit seamlessly into that setting, even if only due to the tale itself being a timeless morality play involving an archetype of the collective unconscious that has existed as long as humanity. While the character of Joker may be inspired by other mythic monsters, alike Loki and Lucifer, in truth, the stereotype of a class clown is exhibited early on in our development as individuals and as a species. The anarchistic jester concept, idealized so accurately on the silver screen here, arises from a backstory similar, essentially, to that alleged for Adolf Hitler. Hitler, 1889-1945, born Adolf Schickelgruber, rose to lead the Nazi Third Reich from humble beginnings as a failing art student and corporal draftee in the German military during World War I, 1914-1918. According to Wikipedia, Quote, Nazi official Hans Frank suggested that Alois' mother had been employed as a housekeeper by a Jewish family in Graz and that the family's 19-year-old son, Leopold Frankenberger, had fathered Alois, end quote, thus making Hitler's mother an exiled heiress. Hitler, a bastard, and, moreover, a quarter Jewish. Modern-day researchers of these claims assert the apparent absence of any Frankenberger family living in Graz at that time is due to the name Frankenberger being an assumed pseudonym for the millionaire banking family, the Rothschilds. Thus, according to this version of events, the story of Adolf Hitler as a poor, disinherited fleck of dust who rises to become a historic symbol and leader of an imperial criminal movement is very similar to the portrayal in this film for the backstory of the comic book character, Joker. Joker uses comedy to disguise his own evil. His character is a perversion of the light. Batman, 
also hides behind a mask, using darkness to his own advantage. Thus, he is a perversion of true evil, a parody of the dark. Just as we see Batman as a hero for satirizing evil, we see Joker as a villain for lampooning good. While Batman stands for law and order, the Joker just wants to see the world burn. Given this origin story for him, however, has Joker been elevated to the status of forgiveness? Have we been shown that black mirror with his made-up clown face in it and felt sympathy for the devil? Will the movie Joker prove to have as much of an impact on its audiences as it has on the history of the character himself? From Joker's perspective, the law and order that Batman stands for is a system comprised of inherited wealth and literally satanic ritual abuse cultism. Thomas Wayne it is implied in this movie, was hardly the angelic savior of a boy in a well. He is seen as, from Bruce Wayne's perspective, in Nolan's Batman series. In point of fact, Thomas Wayne himself, at around the age of 25, was most likely the one responsible for abusing his bastard son, Arthur Fleck, when Arthur was younger than five years old. Again, tinkering with the chronology, this would mean the events of Joker's childhood abuse would have occurred around the year 1895. If we may assume Thomas Wayne was between the ages of 15 and 25 when he conceived Arthur, this would mean Thomas had been born between 1865 and 1875. Thus, the backstory of Batman is a multi-generational tragic comedy of Shakespearean proportions involving ill-gotten gains being passed along from parent to child and the jealousy of the spurned son alike Cain involving repentance and attempts at altruism by rich philanthropists as a means of concealing their own guilty pasts, involving secrets kept by one generation that come to destroy and redefine the next, etc. In the final analysis, the Joker movie does add greatly to the artistic appreciation of comic books, and as such is, as Kevin Smith put it, a good thing for all of us as comic book fans. However, as such, it also places a weapon for increased self-understanding into the hands of a disenfranchised group of people who, opposing society's norms in general, many might not like what, so inspired, they may be able to do with it. The best art mirrors our deepest secrets, I say. The Joker movie, whatever one interprets its message to be, is quite clear about what that message is in itself. What do you get when you cross a mentally ill loner with a society that abandons them and treats them like garbage? You get what you fucking deserve. <laughs>